one. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us on The Connection. This is our time to connect with God for uh, just a few minutes from the Word, and we'd love for you to get your Bibles and study along with me. I'm going to be talking this week about uh, the, the local church, the importance of the local church in every Christian's life. And so um, if, you, if you can, take a moment and share this message with someone. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, then please subscribe and hit like and uh let us know that you're part of uh, uh, the viewing audience, and we sure appreciate that. All right, so Sherry Williams is going to lead us in some worship. I'll be back in just a few moments, and uh, we're going to be discussing the scriptures together. Hang on, get ready, get your Bible open, and let's let's share the word. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost. He's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaker, savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you try to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. You feel lost, he's a way. Search for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. Oh, there's a better life. You got pain, he's a pain taker.
you know there are 79% of all Americans who identify themselves as Christians? 79, almost 80, almost 8 out of 10 Christ, people in America uh, say that they are Christians. Yet statistics tell us that only 20% of Americans attend church regularly. Now, folks, listen, there's some kind of a disconnect when 80% say, yes, I'm a child of God, yes, I'm part of the kingdom of God and the, and the, the body of Christ, but only 20% actually participate in the life of a local church. God's called every believer, every Christian, to be active in the local church. God has ordained it that way. And uh, to some, church attendance is just uh, some way to keep the wife or the the parent off their back. You know, I go so my wife doesn't fuss at me, or I'll go because my parents insist that I attend church. But as soon as I get out of the house, or as soon as I graduate, I am going to do my own thing, and church is not part of that. Well, listen, it's vital that we meet together. The scripture teaches us in Hebrews chapter 10 that we are to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We are to uh, come together and encourage one another and pray with one another, uh, love one another, uh, strengthen one another, lead one another to Christ. And, and uh, you know, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Whenever I get together with other believers, something happens. I, I just I feel like I'm strengthened and I'm challenged and I'm shaped, you know, to, to walk after God and to follow Christ. And so these are some of the things that happen in the local church. Um, some people consider church attendance just punching a spiritual clock or earning brownie points with the man upstairs, you know, trying to make God happy. Well, listen, none of those are, are good reasons to be part of a local church, but it is vital that every believer finds a church and gets active in that church. You see, to someone who understands what the church is really all about, attending a church service can be the most spiritually fulfilling inspiring thing, the most uplifting thing you can do all week long. May I take a moment here to invite you to join me Sunday mornings at 10, 10 o'clock at Life Community Church. I'm actually on the stage of the church right now, bringing you this, uh, this particular episode of The Connection, and um, we'd love for you to come and join us, come and worship with us. Yes, we offer online um, presentations as well. You can pick us up live on Facebook and uh, on YouTube and a few other places. But the, the most important thing is that you gather together with other believers. We, we challenge one another. We shape one another. We help out one another to walk together in, in love and to follow God. You know, <clears throat> we go to school for an education. We go to work to earn a living. We go to the gym for exercise. Some of us like to go to the mall and shop. Some of us like to, to go to the lake and fish or the, the golf course for fun and, and recreation. Well, let me tell you something. The church is vitally important. Some people say, well, why, why church? Why would I want to get up early on my day off? Why would I go through the hassle of getting the kids ready? Why go to the trouble of finding a parking space near the front and a seat near the back? <laughs> you know, why should I go through all that? Um, why go to church? Can I just share a few things from the book of Acts with you about the local church? The book of Acts shows us the birth of the church, actually. Fifty days after Jesus rose from the dead, he sent the Holy Spirit back to the earth to empower disciples. This took place on the day of Pentecost. The word Pentecost means 50. It is a feast that is 50 days after the Passover. Of course, Jesus was crucified on the Passover. And uh, so 50 days actually from his crucifixion uh, is the, the, the time of Pentecost, 50 days. And so Jesus was there for 40 of those days. If you'll remember, when he rose from the dead, he stayed for 40 days and 40 nights where he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He appeared to over 500 uh, people. In one occasion, he appeared to his disciples on multiple occasions. He ate with them, he talked with them, he spoke, you know, and, and traveled and so forth. So in his glorified body, after the resurrection, Jesus was seen. I'm going to talk an eyewitness here. He was seen by over 500 people. Now, if my number is accurate, it was 515 people who saw Jesus alive after they killed him. 
Now listen, that just doesn't happen. That's never happened before, nor, nor will it ever happen again. Jesus rose from the dead, but he didn't just go immediately to heaven. He gave witness uh, for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long period of time. And 40 is the number of change and the number of testing in the Bible. And so he appeared to his disciples. They saw him alive. One of those 515 people was a man by the name of Thomas. I, I really like Thomas's story. We call him Doubting Thomas because he wasn't in the room when the disciples saw Jesus the first time. Jesus appeared to the disciples and uh, spoke to them and they with, with him and they were all amazed and and then he, he left. Well, Thomas comes along later on and the disciples are like, man, we saw Jesus. We saw him alive. And Thomas is like, I don't think so. You guys, I don't know what you've been smoking in here in this room, but, but you didn't see him. I mean, he was put on a cross. He was killed. He was put in the ground. You could, it, could, it couldn't have been him. I don't believe. I'm not going to believe until I can touch the prince in his hands and put my hand on the side where the spear went in this side. I'm not going to believe until I can do those things. And wouldn't you know it, just a few days later, Jesus reappeared to the disciples. This time, uh, Thomas was with the group. This time, Thomas saw him. And this time, Jesus said, Thomas, he said, place your hands in the nail prints. Put your hand in my side and see where they pierced me. See, Jesus knew what he was thinking. He could read his thoughts, and, and he knew what was going on in his mind. And so when Thomas did that, he fell to his, to his knees and cried out, Oh, my Lord and my God. He believed then. And so Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen me. But he said, Blessed are those who have never, never seen me, but yet believe. So over 500 people were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then he... he uh, uh, lifted off of the mountain in, in what's called an ascension, and he went up into heaven. And he, when he arrived in heaven, he then 10 days later sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter number 2 teaches us, that then the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the believers. Um, and once they were empowered by the Spirit, these disciples began preaching the good news of, of, about Jesus, how, how that men could have eternal life by trusting in the cross of Calvary and what was accomplished there, by putting their confidence and their faith in the work of Jesus Christ, that he died for sin, that he rose from the dead for our justification. Believe that, trust that with all your heart, and you too can be saved. And hundreds of thousands listened and believed, and the church began to swell and began to grow. And then at the end of Acts number two, Two, we find this snapshot of life in the early church. And here's how, here's how it reads. It's uh, verse number 41 uh, uh, of Acts chapter 2. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about the backstory. The Holy Spirit is poured out on 120 believers they were in a room we call the upper room. And uh, so the Spirit came. They were all baptized. They all began to speak with other tongues. It was a glorious thing. It was a wonderful thing. They came out of the upper room, and they were still speaking in these languages. And people had gathered from all over the city because they heard this sound like a tornado. They had come through the city. And people gathered from everywhere. And there were thousands of people around this, this, uh, this house. And... Um, so that's when Peter stepped up and began to preach. You remember Peter, the, the guy that was so intimidated uh, that by the little servant girl that he couldn't even witness for Christ? You remember Peter, the man who denied Jesus three different times? You remember, that's the Peter, that's the guy. Now all of a sudden, he is full of the Holy Spirit, and he's not uh, ashamed anymore. He's not afraid anymore. He's not intimidated anymore. He steps up and begins to preach. And uh, the Bible says that at the end of his sermon, people were so moved and so touched in their heart that, that 3,000 gave their lives to Christ. They were baptized. They were added to the church that day. We read on in Acts 2. All the believers devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Notice, they devoted themselves. These men and women were uh, full of the, of, of the Holy Spirit. They were energized by the power of the resurrection that had just taken place. They, they humbled themselves. They, they based their lives on the word of God. They began to share with one another and come into fellowship and in community with other believers. And they devoted themselves to four things. One was the, the, the teaching of the apostles, the apostles' doctrine, what it was they were sharing. They devoted themselves. Now listen, friend, they were, they were devoting themselves like you and I are to devote ourselves. We are to devote ourselves to the local church where we hear the word of God, where we study together, where God's word is proclaimed under a live, living, vibrant anointing of God. Listen, it's, it's so vital that you plug in, that you, that, you, that you are anchored in a local church somewhere. And so they devoted themselves to teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, and which was the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Now, yes, you can do those things at home. Yes, you can do those things in a small group. Yes, you can do those things while you're watching uh, on TV or on your computer or something, uh, or you're live streaming or you're listening to a podcast. Yes, it's, 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 you can do those things. It's possible. But listen, my friend, God has intended that the Christian life is not lived out individually. It's not to be lived out separated from everyone. No man is an island. No woman can go it alone. We need each other. You need the strength of a local church. You need to be able to submit yourself to the teaching of a pastor and leaders within your church. You need to say, you know, I love God and I love his family and I love his church and I'm just going to plug in to a local church and begin to devote myself as the early church did. Then the Bible says in Acts 2, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. My goodness. They sold their property and possessions. They shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together. Can I say that again? They worshiped together. They weren't apart. They were together at the temple each day. In other words, they came to the house of God for worship. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared meals with great joy and generosity. And the last verse, verse 47, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. My, listen to that. Those who were being saved. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, in this paragraph, we realize the real purpose of the church. We realize the importance of meeting together. Looking at this example of this very first group of Christians reveals some of the purposes for the church. I've written down five of them. If I'd like to share them with you, uh, if I may. The first purpose uh, of, of for the church when we look at this group of Christians is membership. All the believers devoted themselves to fellowship, to, suffer, to a, a sharing in meals, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Listen, Jesus gave these new believers a sense of community, a sense of togetherness at a level you can't find anywhere else. You know, I have a, a natural family, an earthly family, and I love being with my earthly family, but I love even more being with my spiritual family that God has placed me in. I've been involved in various organizations through the years here in Aden and Shawnee where we've lived. I've served on boards of missions organizations and, and battered women's shelters and food banks. I, I've been on the board of my Kiwanis Club for a number of years here in Ada. So, so I believe in civic organizations. I believe in humanitarian causes. And, and I, I believe we should be involved to, you know, to, to the degree that we can. But all of that pales in comparison, my friend, with the local church 
the local church, that's where it's at. Jesus gave these new believers a sense of community and togetherness at a level you can't find anywhere else. You can't find that anywhere else in the world but the local church. God wants to take you, my friend. You know, the scripture even says that God takes the solitary and places them in families and breaks their chains. Do you feel like you're all alone? Do you feel like you're trying to live the Christian life by yourself? Well, that was never God's intention. You feel sometimes that nobody really cares and, and nobody really is concerned about your life and nobody really wants to help you get ahead. No one wants to help you be, be a success in your life. Well, listen, friend, that was never God's intention. God wants you to plug yourself in. He's not going to take you and force you into a local church. He's not going to do it. You're going to have to devote yourself. You're going to have to make a decision that says, you know, I'm tired of going it on my own. I'm tired of being on the outside looking in. I want to be a part of a local church. Now, don't be intimidated by the fact that you may not know anybody or that it's all strange environments and you don't know, you know, what do we do next? What do we do first and second and third? I don't know the order of things. I, I'm going to feel out of place. You know, <laughs> the enemy of your soul, the devil, loves that kind of thinking. In fact, he loves to intimidate and 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 dominate you and he loves to put seeds of doubt in your mind that say oh I don't want to go to that church those people don't care for me they're just a social club they just all hang together and nobody really uh, you, nobody really cares about uh, other people they don't they don't care about outsiders they don't care about people who are coming in new well that is not true every church that I know of every life-giving church every Bible believing church that I know of or that I've ever been a part of loves people and loves to bring people into their fellowship. They love to embrace people. And I can't speak for everywhere, but I can speak for Life Community Church, the church that I've been called to pastor, that I've been privileged to be a part of now for 15 years since, oh, since 2006. I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for us. We love people. We care about people. We care about you. We care what's happening in your world. We're, we're concerned. We're concerned about your children. We're concerned, are you raising your children for God? Are you imparting into the next generation the things that are going to last? Are you imparting uh, eternal values into your children? What about your grandchildren? What about your family? You may be living a Christian life and all's well and good, but, but what about your loved ones? Are they lost? Are they on their way to hell? We can help you. We want to help you. We can strengthen you. The Holy Spirit can empower you. We can give you some tools from the Scripture to help you be a witness for Christ and to live your life the way God wants you to live. You can find yourself devoting your life to the teaching of God's Word and devoting your life to fellowship and devoting your life to, to communion and to prayer. God wants that for you. So it's membership. It, it's, it's, uh, that's one of the purposes for the local church. All of us long to belong. We all have a desire to belong. We all want to be, we have a need to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. You see, you and I were created to experience relationship. We weren't created to be alone. As your eye has been created for sight and your ear has been created for hearing, so you, my friend, have been created for relationship. God wants you in, in, in community with other people, and particularly other believers. You see, the people that I hang out with, that's who I'm going to become like. If I choose to fellowship with unbelievers and uh, people who aren't uh, saved or people who don't have a vision for their life, they're not going anywhere, they, they, they're just content to just, you know, hang out in that lower level of living, that's where I'm going to stay. But if I surround myself with believers who care about God and care about His church, people who are going somewhere, people who have a sense of destiny, people who are accomplishing something, people who are supporting missions around the world like our church does. Let me tell you, man, that's an exciting life to live for Jesus Christ and God wants you living it that way. You know, look at today's culture reveals that there's a hunger for fellowship. There's a hunger for community. Commercials I, I see on television that are talking about a 
alcohol. They're talking about the latest fashion. They're, they're talking about beer. Or they're talking about automobiles. It all has to do with relationships. It all has to do with trying to feed this hunger, this desire for relationship that God's placed in the inside of you. And uh, the, the marketers, they'll try to tell you that you can fill it with with this automobile, you can fill it with this beer, or you can fill it with this shampoo, or you can fill it with this uh, clothing line or these shoes. Let me tell you something. All those commercial things, are, they're going to come up empty. They're going to come up, uh, you're not going to be satisfied. They, they won't satisfy the deep hole that you've got inside. That hole God placed there, and it can only work. Your life can only make sense when you put God first and when you fill your life with him. In fact, he wired you so that God, life doesn't make sense without him. Life does not make sense without God. People long to be connected. Psalm 68 and 6, as I mentioned a moment ago, God places the lonely in families and he sets prisoners free and gives them joy. Gives them joy. Not only are we called to membership, we are called to magnification. We're to magnify God with our lives. Uh, Acts 2, 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, praising God. You see, my friend, in case nobody ever told you, <laughs> this, is, this life is not all about you. It's not about making you happy and satisfying you. This life is all about Jesus. And being with the church gives us an opportunity to worship God the Father and his son Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, worship is far more than what goes on in a building on Sunday mornings. Worship is a way of life. But, that's, but we learn those truths um, in, in, in the context of a local church. That's why I've learned to worship since I was a little boy, I used to sing the old hymns, and nowadays, every once in a while, my, my mind will go back to one of those, and I'll remember and start humming or whistling or singing one of those old songs that I learned when I was a little boy. Now, I, I worship God uh, constantly as, as much as I can. I worship him with, my, with singing and with songs and with prayer and, and with uh, adoration. Where did you learn to do that, Pastor? I learned it in a local church. Trust me, I didn't learn it on the ball field. I didn't learn it out hunting in the woods. And you can, you can love God. You can serve God in all those places, and you should. It's wonderful. But God's called us to come together. God's called us to love one another in the context of a local church and to magnify him. Psalm 34, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. <laughs> it's not enough to exalt him on your own. Yes, you can do that, certainly. But you know, most of us don't worship God on our own. Most of us don't worship God when we're bowling. Nothing wrong with bowling, but we, most of us don't worship God then. We don't worship God, most of us, when we're working on our job. You know, I mean, we should and we do occasionally, but, but listen, the way we worship God together and magnify him is coming together with other believers. As a telescope magnifies the moon, it makes the moon bigger to us so that we can see it through it. We see craters and mountains, things we would never see with our naked eye, but the telescope magnifies, and so it is with God. When we magnify and worship him, he becomes bigger in our hearts, and we can see things. We, 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 we stand in awe when we, uh, when, we, when we consider his indescribable beauty and splendor, the things we can't see until we magnify him. Well, the third thing that we're called to do, the third purpose of the local church is to bring us to a place of maturity. Membership, magnification, maturity. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer, Acts 42, or 242. In other words, they were committed to learning more about Jesus. They were committed to growing to become more like him. You know, we don't study the Bible so we can sound smart, uh, smarter than other people. We study so that the Holy Spirit can change us and make us more like Christ. And it's important to come to the place of maturity. You see, attending a life-giving church, a Bible-believing church, growing in fellowship, 
is, 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 how, is what it means to really be like Jesus. You're challenged to follow in his steps. You're inspired to do so. Local churches help us grow in spiritual maturity. Number four, the fourth M is ministry. God's called us to ministry. Ministry is vitally important. If you've not plugged in, if you're not active in ministry, listen, the local church can help you. you, you we can discover uh, together your gifts and develop those gifts and use them for the glory of God. Acts 2 in uh, 43 through 45 says, A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs, and the people sold their property and possessions and shared the money. So while the apostles were healing the sick and the blind and the crippled, other Christians were helping the poor and looking out for one another. And so you see another great reason the church exists and why you should be a part of it is for ministry. You were put on this earth to make a contribution, my friend. You weren't con created just to consume resources, to eat and drink and take up space. But God designed you to make a difference with your life. God wants you to give something back. It's not about you. <laughs> it's about other people. You were created to add to life on this earth. Number five, the fifth and final uh, <clears throat> purpose for the local church is a mission. Now, ministry typically is within the local church, but a mission reaches outside the local church. There's a world out there that needs love and compassion, tenderness. They need healing and help and hope. Acts 2.47, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. The church's mission is the same as Christ's mission. That's to seek and to save the lost. And when you get saved, Jesus adds you to his church. And so his mission becomes your mission, and it's a great commission, the great commission, and that is to share the gospel with the lost and dying world. In the church, we all have the same mission, and that is to share his good news, his saving grace with a lost world, a broken world. And, 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 so, and so the church in Jerusalem, they grew from that 120 that met in the upper room. Uh, they, they walked outside, as I mentioned, and Peter began to preach, and 3,000 were added to the church. They were saved, they were baptized, 3,000. And so by Acts chapter 4, the Bible says the number had risen to 5,000. By Acts chapter 6, there were so many they couldn't even count them all because they knew they had a mission and they set out to get it done. They reached their oikos. They reached, now oikos is a, is a Greek word talking about your, a group of people that you're part of. Some of them could be your family. Some of them could be people you work with. But all of us have an oikos, a sphere of influence, something like 12 to 15 people on average that God has supernaturally and strategically placed us with. You're not where you are by accident. God's placed you there so you can be a witness. You're not in the family that you are by accident. God knew that your family would need a witness, and you are the witness. Thank God for so many Christians I know who are constantly praying. I know, I know dear, uh, dear saints, they can't even get out of their home anymore. They, they watch us on, on uh, YouTube or Facebook or they... They stay in contact with me and they tell me, Pastor Mickey, I'm praying for my family. I'm praying for my children. I don't know what other ministry God's got for me, but while, I'm, while I still have a few years on this planet, I'm going to keep praying for my kids. I'm going to keep praying for my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. Let me tell you, friend, that is remarkable. That's reaching out and loving and touching people, and that's fulfilling your mission, the mission of Christ. In the church, this mission is so powerful and so, uh, uh, so irresistible that I have to ask the question, is anyone going to be in heaven because of you? Are you the reason that someone has been saved? Will anybody in heaven be able to say, I want to thank you because I'm here because you cared enough to share the good news with me. You cared enough to give an offering. You cared enough to return the Lord's tithe to the local church so they could continue preaching the gospel. They could continue winning the lost. 
Somebody's going to thank us, and they're going to say, thank you for giving to missions. We may not even know who they are. We, you know, they may have a different skin color than us, speaking a different language than us. But one day, perhaps, they'll come up to us in heaven and say, thank you for supporting missions. Thank you for giving to that little orphanage in the Philippines. And every month, the church sent a check. I was able to eat. I was able to wear clothing and go to school. I was able to hear the gospel and come to Christ. I was able to attend church and attend Bible school. I pastored my own church, and now I'm here in heaven with you, and you're the one responsible. Thank you for giving to the Lord. So, a life's true purpose then is that you were made to be a member of his church, his family, to magnify his glory, to mature in his image, to be a minister of his mercy, and a missionary of his grace. Friends, let this message sink in tonight, today, whenever you're watching me. Let this message find a resting place in you. Would you do that? Now I want to pray over you, pray with you, and uh, let's look to the Lord. And, and I, I want you just to sincerely pray with me. If these points have hit home with you, the scriptures have been speaking to you, then let's pray that God would apply this to our hearts. Father, in Jesus' name, we lift up our friends and folks who are watching and viewing and who are part of this session uh, of the connection. Lord, may their hearts be open to you and may you be able to speak clearly to them. And Lord, just bring them to a revelation of your call over their lives. The fact that you've called them to be a member of the family. You've called them to magnify your name, to minister to the lost, to share a mission, to come to maturity. Oh God, help us pray in Jesus name and may our local church be faithful to touch lives may our local church be faithful Lord to welcome the hurting and the needy and the, the lost and the, the down and out oh God we, we want to have that kind of a heart as a church bless I pray everyone watching everyone listening in the name of Jesus amen Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. It's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. It's why I sing your praise will ever be. 
will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. Oh, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. God bless you. Take a moment and share this message. If this word has blessed you, share it with someone else today. All right? Amen. Blessings to you.